I was given a bit of a challenge. Uh, the first one is to try and teach Tony something about statistics. Um, and then the rest is, if I see, I throw the gauntlet down now. <laughs> okay, so Jack is the new standard. This was a challenging one because the trial doesn't even fit the patients I was uh, doing. Thank you guys, I really appreciate this debate. Um, if you guys are really nice, you'll just vote for me just to teach Tony a lesson. Um, so the background. Uh, the people who chose this debate are really sadists, and they're my friends, and I like them. Um, so in order to picture role of ruxolitinib and potentially more active JAK inhibitors, we need to ask two questions. What do they do, and why do our patients die? And they're interesting questions to me. I actually got the more interesting side in my, in my viewpoint because the science is really very intriguing. So Several years ago, at a meeting, a guy named Jeff Wall, who's at the Salk Institute, asked this question of me and a group of clinicians, why do the patients with pancreatic cancer die? Why is it that a patient with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor with footballs in their liver is alive and working full time, and a patient with almost nothing in their liver from pancreas cancer metastatic adenocarcinoma is near death? And what is the difference between the two? And of course, the reality is that we're not sure. We don't really know what causes our patients to die. With metastatic pancreas cancer, is brought up earlier, um, embolization, definitely one of the causes of death. Um, but we don't really know everything. However, we do know that our patients are sick. They have a wasting syndrome, they have a cancer cachexia syndrome, and they have a lot of symptoms. Our pancreas cancer patients use up a lot of our time trying to make them feel better, and oftentimes, despite our best efforts, when we thought we were good doctors, we fail, and we're not happy about it. Uh, and certainly the patients aren't satisfied with not feeling well most of the time. So that's an important point to me because the patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, although they also use up an inordinate amount of my time, um, it has nothing to do with actually being sick. And they're, they're mostly got questions about something they read on the internet, which I think is a good thing that they're feeling well enough to read questions on the internet. So the cancer cachexia syndrome has a lot of um, a lot of causes, and we probably don't even understand all of them. I'm just listing off some of the pro-cachexia, anti-cachexia cytokines. I'm not going to test you on these later. And some of the things that are actually produced in, in, the, um, uh, in the tumor that cause anorexia, which we know is a huge problem with these patients. Well, <clears throat> one of the nicest things about CLGB80303 were the, um, the uh, uh, ancillary studies that were done off of it. And one of the things we learned was that pancreas cancer has a boatload of chemokines and cytokines that are produced that actually have an effect on survival, or at least seem to predict worse survival, or in the case of the one anti-cachexia um, um, cytokine, came out with a better survival. So possibly part of the reason our patients are dying is because they have an inflammatory milieu in their bodies, and they are sick. So what is JAK? This is a simple version. As you know, all these diagrams tend to be lies. And uh, we tend to avoid all the other little things that are sticking in here that are doing something um, because I don't understand all those things and my eyes glaze over. Bottom line is cytokines interact with JAK. JAK sets off the STAT pathway. STAT pathway affects the nucleus. There are a lot of other things that affect STAT. MAP kinase pathway ex uh, um, affects STAT. So I'm not going to pretend that this is the only thing. But it is intriguing that the STAT seems to have a role in the signaling of cytokines and chemokines. That's my bottom line from this slide, by the way. <clears throat> so there are a lot of JAKs, JAK1, 2, 3, and TIC2, because we can never name anything always the same, near as I can tell. Um, but I'm just happy we don't have any that sound ridiculous, like mind blown. Um, but JAKs mediate uh, cytokine signaling by activating STAT, like I said. Ruxolitinib is a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor. And one of the things about that is the JAK2 inhibition actually can affect uh, hematologic toxicity, uh, whereas JAK1 does not and just affects the pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, so ruxolitinib definitely reduced levels of inflammatory cytokines uh, and improved symptoms and overall survival in clinical studies of patients with myelofibrosis. And as you know, ruxolitinib is approved uh, for uh, some of the hematologic malignancies I don't understand. So. This was the ruxolitinib trial that uh, Tony briefly touched upon, um, and let me explain the statistics of this. So it was a randomized trial of ruxolitinib uh, versus placebo, both in combination with capesabine. And as Tony pointed out, this is after gemcitabine um, progression. So this is a different population. I certainly wouldn't advocate capesitabine after fulfirinox. 
because there's no logic to that one at all since they've already progressed on 5-FU. But the issue of the ruxolitinib or a JAK inhibition is an interesting one. The study was well balanced. It was well designed. It is a randomized phase two is hypothesis driving. So it's not perfectly balanced. It's not perfect on anything. It is a randomized phase two. And the overall survival, as Tony pointed out, was negative. Um, the intent to treat analysis was negative. However, let me explain to you hazard ratio. Because these statistics are designed around hazard ratio because curves go up and down. And the point of a hazard ratio is to look at a curve versus another curve. So if you're on the standard arm, you, if, if this were 100% accurate, and remember the p-value is not significant so we can't prove it is, but if, you were, if this hazard ratio were 100% accurate, what this means if you were on capecitabine alone, or Cape Sabine plus ruxolitinib, you had basically a 21% less chance of being dead than you would have had on Cape Sabine alone. And so that's what it means. And it's at any time point, but obviously there's variation on curves, especially since you only have a limited number of patients, 64 people per arm. <clears throat> However, when they looked at the people who have the most inflammatory appearance, the difference becomes much wider in terms of overall survival, and the hazard ratio, you have half or less of a chance of being dead with the combination. This is a subset analysis. This is not proof. This is something to design future clinical trials. And that's the way I look at it. But I find this very intriguing. And it says something about our patients, that maybe if you could take the patients who have this inflammatory milieu, who are sick from uh, cancer, chemotherapy, cachexia, maybe you can make them live longer. Maybe you can make it so that the quality of life is better. Maybe you can make it so that you can get the next effective therapy in. Because that's what we're really looking for, is the effective therapy to get in the, into the person. And when they're sick, and then when they're con constantly having symptoms, the one thing you're not doing is giving the therapy. So I'll actually skip this and go on to the modified Glasgow prognostic score, which is what they used on this. Um, just so you know what a modified Glasgow pro uh, 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 prognostic score, um, it's an attempt to look at inflammation and illness, and so they use this, uh, it uses this uh, C-reactive protein and the albumin in combination. This is the score, and the patients with the highest scores, again, one, once again, you look at this, the um, uh, Glasgow prognostic score of two, those patients, again, small subset, total of 36 patients, definitely the ruxolitinib looked like it did a lot better. So you're encouraged that maybe there is something to this inflammatory sick patient that may benefit more from the ruxolitinib than others. And this is the progression-free survival, as, uh, as pointed out by uh, Tony, uh, marginal at best and uh, definitely um, uh, negative for the overall group. But again, when you take the C-reactive protein, higher than uh, 13. It starts separating, but this is where it's important to look at the hazard ratio, not the median. The median, one week. The um, hazard ratio, 0.62, because the separation happens late. Only a subset of the subset actually probably benefits. So um, I won't belabor the grade three or four adverse events, but it wasn't overly toxic except for the hematologic toxicities. Um, which is, a, again, an off-target effect if you're looking for just JAK1 inhibition, which is what the future JAK inhibitors are looking like. They could be more selective JAK1 inhibitors. So my conclusion is the JAK inhibitor ruxolitinib added minimally to survival in an overall population. It became more significant in the patients with inflammatory process. Again, a subset analysis, hypothesis driving. So aside from JAK2 effects on hematologic toxicity, this drug added little or nothing to the side effects of capecitamine. And more selective JAK1 inhibitors are on the way. So while I can't realistically claim that um, you should say that JAK inhibition is the way to go second line after fulfirinox, although I'd love you to do it just for the fun of it, um, you know, just make me feel good one day, um, the bottom line is that that, that may be the future. And, it, and, and one of the things that's scary about this to me is that in the pro-inflammatory patients, the patients with this cancer cachexia syndrome, what we might find is something I actually abused Axel about a lot, um, the, he brought up the concept of bevacizumab beyond progression in colon cancer years and years and years ago. And um, it's possible that um, a drug that truly impacts on, on this inflammatory process may be something we need to continue throughout therapy in order to maintain their health so they can receive the chemotherapy that might be effective. So is there precedent? There is precedent for some of these things that when we, make, when we do small things like adding ibuprofen to megase, 
or just controlling their pain in retrospective and small studies that maybe we did make a difference in the survival. So maybe controlling symptoms matters. Um, I won't go through the cost of pentanoic acid because I'm seeing a yellow, yellow light in detail, but the bottom line is that this also um, had uh, data that suggested that maybe we make some small differences uh, with weight gain um, and quality of life with, uh, um, with something that might reduce symptoms. And so I think it's important when we're uh, dealing with these patients that we start looking at these questions. So we can all agree that our control of pancreas cancer is a disease that's subpar. There's no question. None of us feel good about how well our trials do. We talk about the success of gemabraxane and uh, fulfirinox, and they're both good regimens, but neither one gets us up to the uh, median survival of colon cancer with 5-FU alone. Um, so while trying to find more effective agents, I think we need to be careful as to how we affect quality of life, and we start looking at some of these things that may impact positively on some of the symptoms they have. And so I think JAK inhibitors are something for the future that we need to look at. Whether or not they're actually effective against the cancer, I don't know. But if they're effective against the symptoms, maybe that's just as important. So I'm acknowledging all the slides and Axel, because I always thank him. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>